as is the uh, custom with uh, CEPA events. Uh, this afternoon's session, and thank you for coming, is addressing the challenges of the global economy and stocks and bonds uh, in 2015 and more importantly and beyond. We have three speakers uh, today who uh, bring everything that you need to know to this conversation, or at least that you can know. And they have three things in common. Uh, each of them has spent a lot of time as chief investment strategist. These are people that live, eat, and breathe investment strategy 24-7. And they've done it for a long time, each for more than 20 years, uh, collectively more than 90 years between them. And lastly, they have been successful. So I think we have the right group to address the question. The format for uh, this session uh, will first of all be for each of them to give about 10 minutes of prepared remarks, uh, and each will talk in general terms uh, about their thoughts on investment strategy and then focus on one particular topic. Uh, Russ will focus on developed uh, equities, uh, developed country equities. Uh, Russ, excuse me, <laughs> Bill will focus on fixed income, and John will focus on uh, uh, the emerging market area. Uh, Russ uh, Kostrich will be first. Uh, Russ uh, comes to us from BlackRock. He's the chief investment strategist there. Uh, over 20 years of investment experience. Um, those of you that watch the financial media may have seen his uh, face on uh, various programs as he discusses things with that. And Russ, I'll let you take over at this point. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, so we, we agreed we were going to try to make this a little interactive in the beginning. We had uh, very ambitious notions of using interactive polling, and none of that worked out. So <laughs> if we can go old school, perhaps, just to, to kick this off, uh, I want to talk about the, the environment for developed market equities. And I thought just to maybe take the pulse of the room, we'd start with a quick uh, survey. And raise of hands would be fine. So how many people in the room believe that over the next five years, so a fairly long-term horizon, uh, developed market equities will return above their long-term average nominal return of about 8 or 9 percent. So how first above? Above? Above. 8 or 9? Above 8 or 9 percent. <laughs> All right. How many below? Well, it's a very bearish room. <laughs> well, with that, let me, let me start with maybe then just sort of thinking about that. Uh, I, I actually would intend to agree with, with the vote in the room, although I think that we're going to see tremendous differentiation by region. So in some ways it's a bit of an unfair question because I think that uh, we need to be a bit more specific about what part of the developed markets we're looking at as the valuations and the, the fundamentals and monetary conditions are likely to be very different. But, you know, sitting here today in, in March of, of 2015, there are a couple of milestones that have been hit that are probably a useful place to start. Uh, as many of you know, this Monday was the, the sixth anniversary of the bull market. Uh, this is now, uh, within a week or two, have been the third longest bull market on record. So at least from the perspective of longevity, uh, maybe a bit of a bearish view is not so uh, unreasonable, given we've now extended or gone beyond the, the average life of a bull market. The second milestone that I'm sure many of you are aware of is that we've recently crossed 5,000 on the NASDAQ for the first time in 15 years. And of course, that elicits all sorts of memories about the last time we were at 5,000 and uh, valuations and w are we in another bubble. So as I think about framing the landscape for developed market equities, in some ways it's a very complicated one because I reject the notion that we're at a particularly good stage for putting new money to work, given that we've had a bull market that has gone on for six years and much of that has been driven by multiple expansion. Uh, if you look at developed market equities using the MSCI World Index, you would see that the multiple on that index has gone up by 80% since the beginning of the bull market. So much of the gains we've seen have been predicated on paying more for a dollar of earnings. But I would also reject the notion that we're in a bubble. Uh, if you look at, for example, the NASDAQ, which is you know, one of the, the indices that people are focused on because of this milestone, it's instructive to remember that in February of 2000, uh, a few weeks before the peak, the NASDAQ composite was trading at 176 times trailing earnings. Now, if you looked at a subset of that, the NASDAQ 100, uh, just the, the 100 largest companies, uh, there was no PE because there were no earnings in aggregate. 
Stocks are not cheap today, but it, we're in a very different uh, part of the cycle. The, the trailing PE on the NASDAQ is about 30 times. Again, that's certainly not cheap, but that isn't along with the historical median. If you also consider the fact that we're in an environment where inflation in most developed countries is extremely low, uh, arguably in Europe it's too low, but in the U.S. it's in a sweet spot that's historically been associated with higher multiples, then levels at this point probably don't seem as unreasonable given the fact that we have an artificially low discount rate and with that, it's reasonable to expect that valuations would be a bit stretched as investors are really forced further out on the risk curve. The other thing I'd, I'd say before trying to offer some, some thoughts about what to do going forward is that if you look at the market across two dimensions, you see a lot of heterogeneity in valuations. So the first dimension would be geographic. Uh, the United States has led this bull market for very obvious reasons. We've had the strongest recovery. We have not seen the same issues with our banking system that has persisted in Europe. Uh, and for all of these reasons, you've seen that the multiples on U.S. stocks are significantly higher than they are in other developed countries. So, for example, the S&P 500 trades at about three times book value. Europe and Japan trade for a little more than half of that. So the first point, going back to my question about we need to differentiate, is that if you look at developed markets, we're in very different stages of the cycle in terms of valuation. We're in very different stages of the monetary cycle, which will affect future valuation. So the first bit of advice I would give is that I do think this is a time where investors want to differentiate even within a developed markets. It's not simply EM versus DM. It's also the US, Japan, and Europe. The second point I'd raise in terms of the environment we're in is that if you think about a different dimension, Rather than geography, think about growth. This has been a very unusual bull market. If you look at the parts of the equity market right now that are the most extended, they're at the extremes. So on one hand, you have what I'd call the secular growth companies. Many of them would be located just outside campus. These are small cap biotech companies. These are social media companies. These are companies that have a narrative, at least, that suggests that their growth rate is independent of the overall economy, that their products are so compelling, their business model is so strong that they will generate earnings growth regardless of how strong the economy is. And in a slow growth world, investors have paid a huge premium for access to these companies. So there are certainly parts of the market that are frothy and arguably in a bubble, even if the broader market is not. The really interesting part is that the other end of the spectrum, much of the bull market over the last six years has been led by companies that don't typically lead bull markets. Utilities, consumer staple companies, generally slower growing companies that are often valued for their earnings quality. In other words, the consistency of their earnings, but not for the growth in their earnings. Now, this is strange, but it makes much more sense in the context of another characteristic of the last six years, which is the ultra low level of interest rates. And if you think about what investors have valued, they've valued, they've valued a couple of things. Uh, following the 2000 bear market, the 2008 bear market, they valued lower volatility, and they also value income, which has become increasingly difficult to source from traditional means. So utility companies and consumer staple companies and companies that typically don't lead bull markets have been some of the best performers. Uh, U.S. utility companies last year up 25%. Now, that makes very little sense, except for the fact that you saw the yield on the 10-year go from 3% to 2%, and investors were incredibly desperate to get income, and this portion of the equity market provided that income. So we've got these extreme valuations at the sort of the ends of the distribution. So as we think about where to be in equities, and I would say that even though we're in this, coming into the seventh year of the bull market, we would still, at least for the next six to 12 months, be overweight equities. What we're trying to find is the sensible middle. And I would define the sensible middle is, as those companies that could be characterized as cyclical growth, uh, old technology, for lack of a better term, select consumer companies, even some of the beat it, beaten up energy companies, companies that have reasonable valuations, and also a ben benefit from some gradual improvement in the global economy. So from a style perspective, that's where we see some of the value right now. Now, 
let me switch from style to geography. Uh, one of the places we also see value right now, and it's, it's one that normally I start getting head shaken uh, at me when I say it, is Japan. Now, Japan is, is a country that many portfolio managers have written off for, for many, many years. But over the last two or three years, Japan's actually done quite well. Japanese equities were up 50% in 2013. They outperformed almost every developed market, and they did very well the back half of last year. But the reason that I like Japan going forward is less about past performance, but how it got there. I mentioned in the beginning that one of the defining characteristics of the bull market was a lot of multiple expansion, people paying up for a dollar of earnings. What has been most interesting about the rally in Japanese equities is that Japanese valuations have actually not moved that much. And the reason is we've seen a surge in earnings in Japan. Now, in one sense, that seems strange. Japan was in a recession in Q2 and Q3. How is it that we're seeing this tremendous surge in earnings? And it comes down to a few things, all of which we believe can continue. Uh, one of which is very accommodative monetary policy, which has resulted in a weaker currency. Uh, this has been a, a large tailwind for Japanese exporters, just as the reverse of it, a strong dollar, is proving increasingly difficult for J uh, U.S. Uh, exporters. We had more evidence of that this week with Intel warning. But the second thing about Japan, which is a little less appreciated, is that Japanese companies are doing what companies in the U.S. have been doing the last three or four years. They are taking advantage of very low interest rates, of low leverage uh, levels, and they are levering up their balance sheet and buying back their stock. So basically, they're engaging in the same type of financial engineering that helped U.S. corporate earnings back in 2012 and 13 and 14. Now, this does not last forever, but it can last much longer. And what it's done is it's lifted Japan's notoriously low return on equity to a point where not only are Japanese stocks cheap, but they're increasingly profitable. And then the final point to note about Japan is with the, the Bank of Japan basically buying up virtually every government bond in sight, uh, this has left the pension funds in Japan, which are some of the world's largest, desperate to invest in anything else. And they're taking advantage of the... Uh, well, the lack of supply, really, in Japanese government bonds, and they're now reallocating into Japanese equities. Uh, GPIF, which is the world's largest pension fund, just doubled their allocation to Japanese uh, domestic stocks. So there are a lot of reasons to be concerned about Japan in the long term. We can talk about those. But as I think about opportunities, in addition to style, uh, the international market that we find the most interesting right now is Japan. And I'd say given where their valuations are and given the tailwinds of monetary policy and this change in corporate behavior, uh, that might be one of the more interesting places to be invested over the next couple of years. So with that, I will stop and we will move on. Great. Thank you, uh, Russ. And by the way, there will be plenty of time for questions later, which you probably figured out at 10 minutes each. Uh, next up is Bill Gurton. Uh, Bill is the CEO, Chief Investment Officer, and Founder of Gurton Investment Management, Fixed Income Management. Uh, he spent uh, 10 years earlier in his career with Goldman and about 10 years with uh, Morgan Stanley, so uh, also in the fixed income area. Uh, Bill? Thank you. Um, so first, my question. And there's an operable word in my question, which is it should be think, believe, not want. So my question is, at the end of this year, is the 10-year Treasury going to be below 2.5% or above 2.5%? So below 2.5%, can I get above 2.5%? Almost 50-50. Yeah, almost, almost. This is probably the first year. First year it's been 50-50. Usually the hands go up all for higher rates. So interesting. Um, so anyway, I want to I thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be part of this distinguished panel. Um, so how I'd like to frame this discussion as to, you know, what our view is of 2015 and beyond. I'm going to try to look over there, too. We're kind of oddly on this side of the room. Um, I, I'm going to focus on, first, the economy, then interest rates, <coughs> and then the markets. But our specialty is really in municipal bonds. So I'm going to, when I talk about the markets, I'm going to use municipals as sort of a subcategory for the market. And you know, municipals are kind of interesting because 
I, I think it's sort of, there are a lot of people in this room who are in the investment business, and I think it's the cobbler shoe problem. Um, you know, someday we're all going to invest for ourselves. We're probably all investing for ourselves. But we spend all our time thinking about investing for other people. And if you invest for yourself, <coughs> you're going to end up buying municipals. So I'd encourage you to learn about municipal bonds. I have to listen carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I've been in the business for 30, 30 years. I've learned two things. Um, the first is that either if you're an economist or a manager, if you try to predict yields, you're right about half the time. And um, I don't know, there's some gray hair in this room. So if you remember the beginning of every year, you get the Wall Street Journal and they'd list all the predictions for all the economists on Wall Street. And you know, they, they say, what's the 10-year Treasury going to be at the end of the year? And we actually I, we went back and did a study on this. And probably others have done studies on it. But the predictions were right about half the time, kind of. Um, if you really did the work, you'd find that the predictions were a much better contraindicator <coughs> than an actual predictor of interest rates. So um, with that, uh, here we go. Um, I know it's dangerous, and I got Bernanke talking after me, and I'm going to talk about interest rates. So um, the first thing to recognize is that the Fed, um, really since the uh, Volcker age and, and Greenspan and then Bernanke, um, has become increasingly powerful in controlling interest rates. Um, communication tools, um, policy tools like quantitative easing have made them a much more powerful force in the interest rate markets. Second thing I think to recognize is that Janet Yellen's Fed might be a bit different. Um, from what we've seen so far, it seems as though she wants to create a little uncertainty regarding the course in yields. And I think that Larry Summers talked about this earlier today, that the rise in yields is likely going to be very data dependent. Um, and there's probably not going to be a pre-described course like we had the last um, interest rate rise of the Fed funds. Um, and I think one of the reasons for this is that I think that the Fed would like to reduce risk taking in the marketplace prior to any rise in rates. And hopefully it reduces the volatility because you saw what happened, they call it the taper tantrum. Um, but we had an outsized move in the 10-year um, once the Fed sort of even hinted about stopping quantitative easing. Um, what we believe uh, is the direction of rates is going to be highly dependent upon the economy, inflation, and then the Fed will respond to that. Um, another argument that we found to be sort of inaccurate is when we talk about interest rates, there's been, I, didn't hear, I haven't heard it here, but I read a lot about it in the paper, you hear it on TV, is um, this argument that competition from overseas rates will keep our rates low. Um, we actually did some research on that, and we looked out over the past, long term there is a good correlation, but over the past five years, the correlation of, say, the, the Japanese yields, the Eurozone yields, and U.S. Treasuries is, is much lower than usual. So in, in actuality, while their rates have been low, they, they have not been correlated to driving our interest rates lower. Um, what we think the real mechanism is, it's not this competition from overseas rates. Um, you know, that's more a result. What the mechanism is that if the overseas economies are weak, um, if our dollar is strong, if there's an exporting of deflation, then that will turn into affecting our economy affecting our inflation rate. And so if there is weakness, if there is deflation, um, then what we would expect is that rates will stay lower for longer. However, that's not our base case. Our base case is um, that we believe QE will be effective. Um, you know, we heard Professor Sin talking about this earlier today. 
he was he was he he believed that QE was effective in the U.S. Again, I would point to the fact that the two places where there was QE was the U.S. and the U.K. And in both instances, there's higher inflation, higher interest rates in the eurozone. So it seems like it must have had some impact. So we think it will be successful in strengthening the economy. We think it will be successful in inflating. We think oil will act as a tax cut, um, and that. Our base case is the economy improves, the employment situation improves, inflation at least bottoms. And if that's the case, and the Fed will raise rates this year, was it, is it June, is it September? I don't really know. But when they raise, it'll be slow, it'll be deliberate, and there'll be no roadmap. Um, now that's what I think. Let me tell you what I know about the markets. Um, and I'm gonna again use municipals as the case study. Markets are less liquid. Um, Dodd-Frank has, has caused higher capital standards for the banks. The banks hold less inventory. And you point to something like municipal bonds. Municipal bonds, secondary trading, is about half of what it was pre-credit crisis. So there's less liquidity in the market. There's an increase in the amount of passive money. Um, ETFs in the fixed income markets. And then in the municipal market, there really isn't an ETF. But the mutual fund complex, the municipal mutual fund complex, has nearly doubled um, in, since the credit crisis. So doubling of the mutual fund complex and secondary trading cut in half, not good for liquidity. So when you have, um, and, and the third thing about the, uh, the fixed income markets and municipals in particular is people confuse return with income. And so you end up people getting, seeing individuals selling when rates are rising. You see individuals buying when rates are falling. There are fund outflows as rates rise. So in general, what people end up doing is buying when prices are high, selling when prices are low. So anyway, um, what does this mean for the fixed income markets if in fact rates do rise? Uh, first, there's going to be increased volatility. Uh, this is especially true in municipals because the market is 70% retail. So as interest rates rise, you get kind of a vicious cycle. Rates rise, people sell out of funds, they sell into illiquid markets. What does that result in? Rates actually overshoot. And it happens to be worse in municipals. I mean, municipal yields on an absolute basis, rose more than treasury yields in 2013 on the long end. So um, what you see is, as rates rise, municipals become more attractive relative to treasuries. So there's an opportunity to buy the broad market in municipal bonds, and rates in general will likely overshoot. The second thing is sp spreads will rise. But the interesting thing about municipals, and I'm not sure about other markets, but the municipal market, they tend to rise randomly. Um, the reason for this is that prior to 2008, prior to the credit crisis, the municipal bond market was either, you were either insured or you were double or triple A on your own. There was no spread in the market. And with no spread, there was no real reason to do fundamental research. So there tends to be a lack of good fundamental research in the municipal market. And since the credit crisis, the market has become ever more dependent on the ratings agencies as an arbiter of credit. So we all know how suboptimal that is. Um, so what's gonna happen? What do we see if, we, when we, if and when we see a rate rise? I think it'll be a tough time for sort of unsophisticated investors. Um, however, it's a great time if you have, if you're a little more sophisticated, if you have the research, if you have the research capabilities and you have the liquidity. So with that. Great, thank you, Bill. Uh, next is John Gunn. Uh, if you read our backgrounds, you know I'm familiar with John for a few decades. Uh, and uh, we could tell stories, but we won't. <laughs> Uh, John is the former chair and CEO of Dodge & Cox, still very, very active on investment strategy with Dodge & Cox. 
Uh, he's also chair of the advisory uh, board for CEPR, uh, so quite involved with this organization. And John, I'll let you take it from here. Okay, I'm going to uh, talk long term, and that is sort of uh, longer than the short term that occupies CNBC, and it's shorter than the Keynes long term where we're all dead. <laughs> so that kind of boils down to five years. And the reason uh, talking long term is that I think the best long term the best long term picks lead to the best short term performance actually, and uniquely enough. But that's actually not the primary reason. What it what happens is that the market is enormously unpredictable. It's, it has hundreds of independent variables and all kinds of things that are you know, potholes in the road and one thing and another that can cause various volatilities. And so the five-year process gives you a chance on something that has low valuation for it, and you, you believe that it still has a valuable business franchise to work out. And so, uh, you know, I go back to, uh, Hewlett Packard selling at $12 or $14 a share in the fall of 2012. And uh, there was an interview with the technology analyst on CNBC. And the interviewer said, Well, you know, what do you think of Hewlett Packard? And he says, This is a dead company. And, and, then, and then she said, well, well, aren't they getting ready to split it up? And he said, In that case, it'll be two dead companies. <laughs> So anyway, it, 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 so it, and and it also allows for companies that have growth opportunities that are selling at sort of an average PE multiple, not a particularly high one, for them to develop their their process to develop the growth, and gives that a chance to work. All right. So the methodology on this is to. Think of an all-cash portfolio, mainly your wealth, and say, okay, I'm going to invest it. Where am I going to invest it today? And put it in a safe deposit box that doesn't open for five years. Uh, that's actually something that we think about a lot. Obviously hypothetical, and obviously next week you can, you can, you know, you, you're not going to be bound by that. So. But it's a mental uh, gymnastic, I think, is worthwhile. So what are the objectives of this five-year period? And that is to uh, invest somewhere in a portfolio that's going to preserve and enhance the future purchasing power of your wealth and hopefully remain, you know, go up north of the uh, market indices. Um, so the first thing that you ask yourself, or I would ask myself, is what doesn't work? So in like in 99 or 2000, we had 65% of the S&P 500 was basically hazardous to your financial health because it had such high valuations. The uh, largest 50 companies in the S&P 500 sold at about 30 times earnings. Um, so, we, so today, what doesn't work is basically bonds. <laughs> Not to be insulting. <laughs> and I don't know about the munis. I don't, I, I, I don't know that nuance. No, right. And, and so, and, and so I, uh, matter of fact, I was talking to Armenio Vraga and we were saying, you know, she would love to interview those people that are buying the 10-year German bonds at, you know, a quarter percent or half percent and trying to figure out what they're thinking about. Um, so I don't get that. And so l let me give you a, a, a kind of an equity framework very briefly. And that is you just sort of think of, <clears throat> on this side, valuation. And on this side, the sort of range of outcomes, profit income outcomes for a company out um, five years, which is a function of three different 
factors, the, the current strength of the business franchise, management expertise, and uh, then growth opportunities. So what happens today is that unlike 99 and 2000, where there's a huge valuation gap within the equity market, the valuation range is quite narrow. There's not very many things that I can spot in the S&P 500 that I think are just totally overpriced. So anyway, I, uh, to me it's fairly narrow, and so we have to think about what are the forces that are powering growth in the global economy. And so one of them I'm just going to read from Schmitz, Mary Schmitz and Jared Cohn's book. The New Digital Age. By 2025, the majority of the world's population will in one generation have gone from having virtually no access to unfiltered information to accessing all the world, world's information through a device that fits in the palm of the hand. If the current pace of technological innovation is maintained, the most of the projected 8 billion people on the earth will be online. Wait a minute. Nothing like this has ever happened, and it's all happening today. This is amazing, because the key part of growth is specialize and exchange. And so, I believe that we're in the early innings of a global economic expansion that will go on for potentially a long time. May have potholes in it and whatever, but nothing like 0809, which the last time 0809 happened was in 07, 1907. And that is a basically a financial panic, and I think that the odds of it, all, all, all this is probabilities. I mean, we're, 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 nobody knows anything out the, way out there. But I think that this is happening. Like the biggest event to me was in 2014, was <clears throat> Modi taking over in India and booting the Congress Party, which would brought the worst part of the UK's socialism to India. Uh, booted them right into the Indian Ocean. So I, I, I think that this is all sort of occurring, and it's going to be. Uh, let me let me give you an example of sectors that I think are interesting, and that's tech, technology, media, pharma, healthcare. Those are the three big ones because they're all areas of innovation and they're areas where the U.S. has sort of fairly large control. In the global equity market, the 60 percent of the technology sector are U.S. companies, 60 percent. They are all global. They will all be at very active in building the infrastructure that will come along over the next 5, 10, and 15 years in the developing world. And so, um, what could, now, now let's get, let's, you know, we get on to the end of the limb. Um, so, I en envision a 5 to 7 percent sort of profit growth the 2% dividend plus the probabilities, non-trivial probabilities, not highly likely, over five, six, seven years of a 1% to 4% annualized increase in the multiple. That gives you to 8 to 13. And you're... Uh, I'll give you an analogy, and uh, the only one I know in this room is David Morgan Thaler, who probably knows about this analogy, but 
in the 19, mid to 1950s, mid to late 50s, excuse me, there was a, a manager out on the West Coast and a manager out on the East Coast. The guy on the East Coast was T. Rowe Price, the guy on the West Coast was Phil Fisher. And they looked at the market, and it was a dividend yield market, which was, every, was everybody's active in it. And, it, and uh, they said, well, the best things are available are these companies that are at, really don't have that high of a dividend yield because they're spending all their money to pour back into their business to grow it. And so those were all kind of selling at a PE multiple of the S&P or slightly below. They were in the way, as it turns out, um, uh, they were in the way of technological innovation, plus they were in the way of the expansion of the consumer discretionary income of the, the, of the U.S. consumer. Today, technological innovation is still occurring, and you have to get in the way of the expansion in the consumer discretionary income of the developing world consumer. Thank you, John. At this point, we'd like to hear what you'd like to talk about. So if you have questions, now would be a great time. Okay. One question I have around earnings growth is, what do you uh, anticipate to be the composition <laughs> of earnings growth going for in terms of core in an environment where profit margins are close to all-time highs and such? I mean, in yeah. terms of, I mean earnings growth, you know, so much is attributable to stock buy buybacks in the last couple of years, over a trillion dollars in the top 100 <laughs> companies last year. Obviously, it's got to go more to core to get what you think. Well, there's a couple of things about the um, – I think there's a – if you go back and look at profit margins, there's a lot of difference – looking at the composition of the S&P 500 today versus the 60s or because it was all it was an industrial index at that time and now it's really not it's it is a highly an index that's highly dominated by companies with intellectual capital the other part of it is that 35 40% of earnings from in the S&P 500 come from overseas and so this probably also expands margins somewhat. I mean, I, I, honestly, that's, I think, you, you know, you, you, that's one of the, one of the writs. Uh, there's no, the other part of it also is that the mm. composition of earnings have a very high quality because the free cash flow composition of them is very high. Mm. I would just add one other element, which, you know, this has been an unusual bull market in that the margins globally, but particularly for U.S. companies, have levitated at levels that have historically been close to the peak. And, you know, again, John raises a good point. It, it's, it's not comparable to past cycles because more of the sales are overseas. But you have been at about 10 percent of GDP, which in the past is a level which you'd start to expect some mean reversion. Now, here's the thing that I think is maybe underappreciated. This Recovery has been characterized by, by slow growth. We spoke about slow nominal growth. And as part of that, you've had an environment where rates have obviously been well below uh, their historical levels, and wage growth has been exceptionally slow. Even with the rebound in the labor market, we've yet to see that really translate into faster uh, wage growth. The flip side of that from a margin perspective, if you think about it from a company's standpoint, is that your two big input costs, the cost of capital, and the cost of labor have remained remarkably cheap. Now, whether or not that's sustainable is a very interesting question. It has to do with whether or not, what are the reasons that interest rates have remained as low as they have been? Uh, why has wage growth not responded to the improvement in the labor market? Uh, will there be political interference that causes wages to rise in a way that's not market driven? But I would just take note that this slow recovery has been a very good friend to most companies because it's kept their margins unusually high. get paid back. The second rule of lending is don't forget the first rule. Uh, the canary in the coal mine in 2008 was subprime borrowers would go in like a casino and ask how many chips they could buy, and they said all you want. 
and you don't have to pay us back. What similarity do we have to the subprime countries out there that are trading wealth in the U.S. tenure, borrowing obscene amounts of money? Are they the new canary in the coal mine in this tax sector? Could be. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't buy their debt. <laughs> Well, maybe a bond guy should answer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think he'd buy it either. <laughs> yeah, I, well, first of all, we're, we're more domestic in nature. But, um, you know, I would say that, you know, there are examples where that I can point to that might not be um, overseas, but something like a Puerto Rico, where, um, you know, you've got, and I, I don't think it's systemic, but uh, it, it could be, act as an example for things that are going on in the overseas markets. And so you have Puerto Rico, their economy is in shambles. Um, they uh, are not addressing their problems um, in terms of the amount of debt they have outstanding. And right now, it's, I would think it's a lot, much, very much akin to the Latin American debt crisis in the 70s, where the, the people who are invested in Puerto Rico are incented to put, to set, to, to, to invest good money after bad. And so, you know, and you also have a lot of investors that are non-traditional municipal bonds currently in Puerto Rico. So, you know, in our opinion, that is a case. And maybe, you know, it's a good case for what's going on in other places where, you know, lenders are throwing good money after bad. And, and, you know, investing only because they're investing with the hope if they throw more money at a problem, that it's going to go away. And so that might be the same thing in Greece. You know, we, we heard about it this morning. We're seeing it in Puerto Rico and some other places in the municipal market. There's a great phrase in the 70s, a rolling loan gathers no loss. <laughs> <laughs> No, the only thing I just add quickly is I, I think it's a little bit hard on the European debt to, to draw the same conclusions because you have a situation where the marginal buyer, now the European Central Bank, is not buying these bonds on the hope of an economic return. They're buying the bonds as a tool of monetary policy. So I, I do think that changes the calculus and it makes the comparison a little bit more difficult. Uh, where I think it gets harder is when you look at things, for example, uh, Nestle had an issue recently uh, in Europe it had a negative yield. So effectively, you've got uh, individuals that are paying Nestle for the privilege of lending to them. Maybe, maybe that's the canary in the coal mine. Uh, John, when you mention my name, I assume you're referring to my age. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd like to ask the panel, you and then the rest of your panelists, when do you believe that the commodity cycle is going to turn particularly the price of iron ore and oil? Uh, the price of oil, perhaps I should be more enthusiastic, but if you look at the price of oil, it first went over $100 a barrel, I believe in 07, something along that line. Then it dipped down in the 08, 09, but then came back very quickly. And so I just, it, what happens on oil is just like the last time when for, you went from $2 a barrel OPEC crude oil in early 73 to $40 a barrel at the end of 80, is that it, basically triggers a whole bunch of supply and demand elasticities. And this time, it's triggered a lot of supply elasticities. They made the development of shale oil in the United States and the whole notion of how you view shale gas, which is present all around the world, but which is developed in the United States first because it, we, we have our property rights include to the shale gas underneath them, underneath the, the property that you own. Um, 
So, I, and then on the other side, you have the six billion people that are all charging up the hill uh, and are on the road to modernity. So it's kind of a battle. The problem, the, the other problem is that you look at the real price of oil, it's still very high, even at $50 a barrel. So I don't know, I'm not, um, I'm not a great you know, enthusiast about it, but on the other hand, I, I don't know, what do we, we we're, we're, we're sort of, we're sort of average, we're sort of market weighted in it right now. I don't really, I don't know, you guys don't know what, I'm not sure about that, that in, or, or copper, I don't really. No, I'm not an expert on that. I would say with oil, um, oil is interesting because it's, is it a supply problem or is it a demand problem? And I think it's probably both. And the supply problem isn't going away, but if the global economies improve, then likely some of the demand problem will go away. So you'll probably see some rise in oil, oil with a rise with a stronger economy, but it probably isn't going to go back to where it was because we have a supply issue in oil. Like for 20 years, Saddam Hussein ruled over Iraq and was basically thick as three boards and in many ways, and also very violent. He never did any exploration in Iraq. And some of the people at Schlumberger that we've talked to figure that out 10 years, they could be up to 10 or 11 million barrels a day. I don't know. Yeah, I would agree that the supply is the key. You know, iron ore is a little bit interesting. I spent a lot of time in Australia. You know, all of the supply came on at exactly the wrong time. You know, they, you know we talk about, uh, Dr. Summers spoke about extrapolating trends. They extrapolated Chinese 10% GDP forever. And you had a lot of supply coming uh, on, online in Western Australia. And it's going to take a long time to work through that supply. So I think iron ore is lower. Oil is a little different. And I, I will just give you a slightly different perspective. I think the, the shale production in the U.S., it's deceleration. It's decelerating. It's not slowing. We're pumping 9.3 million barrels a day, despite the fact we've cut back uh, horizontal rig count by 25% since October. Mm -hmm. The reality is, like a lot of technology, it just takes less to get the oil out of the ground. I'm actually a little bit more sanguine on oil because of the Middle East. And here's where I think it does get interesting. The other thing that happened last year, people focused on demand. They focused on the U.S. shale revolution. What got lost in the discussion is that Middle Eastern supply was incredibly resilient. You know, Libya is in the midst of a civil war. Yet, miraculously, Libyan production went from 200,000 barrels a day up to a million by October. The market did not expect that. Iraqi production went up. Uh, if you look at where a lot of the supply is coming from the Middle East, I'd highlight Libya, Iraq, Nigeria, South Sudan. These are not exactly stable places. And I think as you consider the price of oil, there is this wild card. A lot of this production came on and surprised the markets. It could just as easily come off. For example, in Libya, it's collapsed back down to 200,000 barrels a day. Now, I have no idea what the political situation in Iraq will look like uh, in five years' time, but I do know that oil uh, estimates for OPEC assume that Iraqi production can double to 8 million barrels a day by 2020. If that production does not come online for all of the reasons it might not, that will change the dynamic. I'd like to know if any of the panel members have any thoughts about Chinese equities. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next question? No. <laughs> um, um, we have a major effort to I think it's one of the more important things over the next five to ten years is to be prepared to profitably invest in public companies in China. And uh, I, everything as we, we heard today, like John Lipsky talked about, they, everything that they say in the last, this 12th five-year plan is Sounds good. Of course, then John adds that he said it in the 11th five-year plan, and it didn't really pan out. 
So I don't, I don't know exactly, uh, but uh, to me, the, it, it, it's very interesting. I don't know how many of you have read um, Kissinger's book on China, which I think is a very interesting book, because for our mind, our sort of Western economic mind, something's going on in China that's very different than I think that, uh, that, and we don't have that much touch of it. And, and, and what they're doing, I think, is to reclaim their position as a great nation. So anyway, so I wouldn't uh, be, I, I think it's very difficult to, you know, uh, to, to predict these things. I, I think the key thing in operating in the emerging markets is valuation. And because you want to go into, because basically they're all, it, it, it's, they're all uh, in, in the way of the information economy. And, and that's intertwined with the extension of free markets. And they're all kind of, and so you want to be in the low, low valuation area. We talked to, I don't know how many of you people were here last year, but uh, Condi Rice interviewed a guy named S Sergey Guryev that had been for six years on the board of Sparebank. And so we spent about a little over an hour talking to him in, in December or in November or sometime. And uh, uh, that probably is one of the you know, it, it is, uh, if you don't mind the potential sanctions or whatever, uh, it's, uh, it, it's an exciting uh, deal. Uh, the, the guy, Herman Greff, who uh, runs it, thinks that they can double earnings over the next five years, and uh, it sells at uh, four times earnings, which is low. When I hear your outlooks uh, on stocks, there's almost no mention of the background of policy, except for this new gigantic, powerful agency. What about all the other policies that must be part of your policies? It's, it could be good, it could be better. There's it's a regulatory policy, there's the budget, there's whole wide range of things you'd think that your forecast would depend on some, but no mention of it. Is that just because you're assuming something you don't want to tell us about? Or what? <laughs> We're assuming you're going to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> no. Go ahead. You know, it's funny. We, we spent, we've spent a lot of time on policy in the U.S. and Europe the last five years. I'm not sure we figured anything out. Uh, and I think there are a few things going on, you know, one of which is just the strange sort of political environment we're in in the U.S., where there's an assumption, which may not be reasonable long term, but has sort of been worked out in the near term, that the current political configuration has led us to an environment where we just have paralysis. And I think most of the policy issues you discuss, the long-term fiscal situation, the effect of regulations, are very relevant for the long term and for growth they may have less of an impact on the short term. The other thing, you know, you mentioned the Fed. Uh, I think the other reason we've, you know, probably the, in most of the financial sector has spent so much time obsessing about the Fed and their every utterance is this has been the dominant factor really since the, the, the market came out of the, the bear market in 09. And whether I think about the volatility regime, which has been incredibly influenced, I think, by ultra accommodative monetary policy, or if I think about the distortions in parts of the market where investors are reaching for yield, again, because of Fed policy, uh, this seems to be the key driver. And now it's increasingly not just in the U.S., it's in Japan, it's been Europe. So, you know, if I think about this as a statistician, I think what's the first principal component? That, that monetary policy, at least in the time frame for most investors, at least looking out 12 months, is probably been by far the dominant issue to focus on. Yeah, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just add to that, that um, there's been a great dependence. Fiscal policy has, there's been such gridlock that you can't even depend upon fiscal policy. I think 
we would all love to see some type of bipartisan action and count on that, maybe to act as a stimulative effect to the economy. But what, what has happened is, the, in terms of uh, our government, I think we focused on the Fed. We've allowed the Fed, to the Fed to do all the heavy lifting for us. So it's hard to believe, unless we get some real change in our government structure, that you're going to see anything real come out of the government. So really ignoring that or, or staying away from it is just a placid kind of you know, implication of the way our government's being run today, and we'll just count on the Fed to do the heavy lifting for us. Well, I don't, I, I don't really, um, I'm, I'm not sure we're, uh, we may be somewhat extreme, or I am maybe, probably. Uh, I, I, I don't think that the Fed has much to do with <laughs> practically anything right now. And so I just, I, I believe that we're heading toward an election in 16. And then after in 17, I think that we're going to get a lot of different uh, rational policy changes that will occur almost regardless of who gets elected. And uh, so, I don't know, Obama's been playing some sort of a hardcore game here on uh, uh, and soon he'll be in Chicago. So uh, I, I, th I think that's, and, 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 and meanwhile, there's just a lot of things, a lot of opportunities that are, that are all over the place. And with technological innovation, and uh, we were uh, talking to a French company that is, uh, 40% of their businesses in the developing world, 5% is in France. The CEO lives in Hong Kong. <laughs> and it's absolutely, and they're, in, they're a real power in, in, in electric distribution over the entire world. So th there's a lot of different things that are out there. And they all, I mean, even if we're kind of pessimistic about it, it looks pretty good in relationship to bonds. Just maybe add one other thing, which I think from a <laughs> bonds are bad. <laughs> well, they just said they're not bad. They're just, they have low returns. <laughs> I, can't, I can't argue with that. I, I do think there, there also there's a behavioral component of this, probably which the industry is guilty of. Uh, if you think about the last five years, whether you think about the debt ceiling in the U.S. in 2011 or any of the various chapters of the European drama, most institutional investors have done well by closing their eyes and assuming there'll be a last minute compromise. That's actually been a fairly effective strategy the last five years. Now clearly there's going to come a time when we're wrong and whether this is about Greece or eventually you know the U.S. fiscal situation who knows but I, I would if I maybe think about the what's implicit in the question there probably is some complacency because just assuming that there'll always be some solution has worked out fairly well as an investment strategy the last half decade. I'd like to say one thing, which is I think you're just jealous because <laughs> since 2008, I think bonds have done pretty darn well versus equities. So, um, you know. That might be. Yeah. No, that's, that's, I mean, a, that's I mean, a true statement. But, but, but that's in the past. I don't deal in the past. <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I, <coughs> past so, returns don't mean anything to me about future in terms of future returns. I agree with that. Although and I'm not, may be because basically there's not a momentum bone in our body. Yeah, I agree. I'm not so sure too many people were talking about how great bonds were in 2008 and 2000. No, no, you're yeah. absolutely right. They're not. It was a you know a good place to be in bonds <laughs> that time. <laughs> okay, I'll come back to you. Do you think we're policymakers are better or worse off than they were in 08 in terms of dealing with a shock or a crisis? Having learned from it, but maybe they have less um, firepower to deal with it. I, I would clearly say worse, uh, you know, particularly in the United States. I, I don't know what the policy response would be if there was an exogenous shock. Uh, it seems difficult to kickstart QE. Uh, you're at zero. I mean, you could extend forward guidance, but at this point, you know, there'd be a knee-jerk reaction by the stock market. I don't know if there's a clear economic transmission mechanism. 
Uh, I think in Europe it's a little bit easier because, you know, getting the euro down does have some meaningful economic impact. But I, I think the Fed isn't a problem, a very serious problem, if there's any type of shock. I, I think the, 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 the banking sector is at something like an 80-year high, or maybe it's 60 years, I don't know, whatever it is, in terms of equity to assets. What keeps the, uh, the probabilities low for the wheels coming off the vehicle is that everybody went through 08, 09, and are still playing. I, th I, th I, th I think it was uh, Larry Summers even said that today, keep the, the, everybody's still playing on fear, and uh, we see that. Yeah, I, I actually think we'd see bipartisan action if there was any type of credit crisis. So I think that uh, we've been through it before, and I think that would help us. I actually think that QE would probably go into place, but I also think it's, it's, it's probably a wise reason for the Fed to at some point acknowledge that the, the markets are functioning, the economy's doing okay. So let's raise rates a little bit, because at least it gives us somewhere to go if in fact there is a crisis. I may rue the day I said this, but, but, but when we're talking about QE and whatever, and how this supposedly works and all this junk, I, I the, the uh, Voltaire said the art of being a physician is amusing the patient while nature cures the disease. I think QE is sort of like that. So here's a question for Russ and Bill. Um, so how much do you actually think the Fed will raise rates this year? And, and really, how much effect do you think it's really going to have on the 10-year, given the differential rates in Germany? Where, where are institutional buyers going to put their money? Are they going to put it in the U.S. in the 10-year where the dollar's strong? Or are they going to, are they going to start buying it 25 bips, German 10-year? Um, yeah, again, you know, we did a study on the correlation between Eurozone yields in the U.S., and they actually have been quite uncorrelated. So uh, first of all, I don't think the argument of the demand for overseas bonds really will drive, driving our rates lower, really holds water. Um, you know, I think that if the Fed does raise rates, I think that what we generally see, and we've seen it in all rate rises over the past 30 years is that the 10 year will go higher. And there will probably be some knee jerk reaction. And my guess is that the 10 year will overshoot. So I think we'll probably get pretty good volatility in the markets if and when the Fed decides to raise rates. Uh, I would agree that the 10 year goes higher. I don't know how much higher it would go for a couple of reasons. I, I, we have a supply demand imbalance in bonds, which seems strange. Uh, but depending upon which estimate when, when you want to look at, this year it's about four or five hundred billion dollars. As you point out, there's still a very big bid for institutions. This took everyone by surprise in 14 because the institutions came in and bid up bonds at a time when everyone spoke about the great rotation. Uh, the one thing I would say, I think to some extent we're all focusing on the wrong problem. There's this obsession about does the Fed go in June and September. I, I think it's one or the other. I'm not quite sure which. But I would say it doesn't matter as much as the response function. And what I think is different about the response function, or might be different this time, you've had $2 trillion going to bond funds since the financial crisis. I've spoken with a lot of advisors, and it's very interesting when you hear why people bought these bond funds. And it wasn't always this very rational response about shifting the portfolio given slower nominal growth. It was more, my money market's gone to zero. I need something with yield. This bond fund I found offers yield. I'll buy that. And whether or not everyone who's poured that $2 trillion into bond funds over the last, you know, seven or eight years appreciates the duration risk they've taken on, duration risk, which up until now has worked in their favor, is an open question. So I'm less worried about the Fed as I'm worried about what happens in September or October when millions of individuals start to open their account statements and suddenly found out, find out this is not a stable value fund. Uh, bond funds can go down. And, and what they do, you know, we had a little bit of taste of that during the taper tantrum, but that was short-lived. The Fed didn't do anything. They just simply mused about one day they may do something. Uh, you now have half a generation of investors who've never seen a tightening cycle. 
So that to me is, is a bigger concern than the Fed going too fast. Plus, I don't think the Fed really has control of the 10 year. Uh, you all touched on technology innovation in your talks. Uh, and there are several startups around the valley with crowdfunding apps like Wealthfront and Learning Club. How do you see technology innovation changing um, your relative industries? You mean money management? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I think that um, the, the greatest thing, that, one of the great things that technology can do for us is transparency. And, <clears throat> you know, I still think that there is not enough transparency in the financial markets. And I think that, A, creating more transparency will be a positive thing. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, posting trades, immediately when they happen, um, all those types of things would be really good for the markets. I think the second thing is, um, you know, there's an app out there called Robinhood, which is zero cost trading. And if we can <coughs> educate young people on investing early on through something like a Robinhood app, I think that would be a wonderful thing. So, you know, being able to bring investments to the masses at an affordable rate, um, maybe they'll make some mistakes, but it will be an opportunity for them to learn early on w about some respect for investing. So I think those types of things, and obviously lowering costs, um, you know, for money managers, um, you know, allowing us to reduce our costs would be a wonderful thing, and, and, and technology would be great for that. I'm not sure our shareholders agree with that, but uh, <laughs> no, I, you know, the, it's right, the, the robo-advisors, the wealth fronts, and the, and the betterments, and uh, Nutmeg, I, I do think this is a very transformative technology, and it, it does lend itself to the notion that, look, you can build a very decent portfolio with instruments today like ETFs, uh, index funds, and do it much cheaper than has been the typical cost for many of the providers. But I, I think it will take a little time, and, and the reason is not because it's not a very good product, but it's about human behavior. So I met with uh, a few entrepreneurs who were starting a similar business about six months ago, and they were explaining to me the app and the portfolios they were building. You know, They were taking all of this behavioral research, building these very reasonable, rational, good long-term portfolios. What was interesting about it is they were very excited about how they could basically scrape all of this data from your Facebook page and get a much more accurate feel for your risk tolerance than asking you five or six questions, which might happen if you went into a Merrill Lynch office. And they're telling me about this, and they're showing me the app. I said, this is fantastic. But here's the problem. 60-year-old people who have most of the money do not have Facebook pages. So this is very, this is a app that makes a lot of sense. But you also have to take into account that a lot of the wealth in this country is owned by older people that may take a little bit longer to either embrace this or you may don't need a generational shift. <laughs> or don't, yeah, don't have the app. So uh, it, may, it may take a few more years, but I, I do think it is going to lead in a different direction. I think fees are gonna be under pressure for quite a while because the market is, doesn't really, is not conducive to having high fees. other end of the spectrum, just sort of prompted this thought of my party, is that an enormous amount of money has gone into hedge funds. And sort of indexes claimed a big chunk. Hedge yeah. funds have claimed a big chunk. And sort of uh, the conventional money management industry has gotten squeezed to some extent in between. But I'm just curious, sort of thoughts on, you know, looking out to your five-year horizon, what the world looks like five years from now on that front. Well, I would think that it would be a tremendous pressure against hedge funds, because I think the, uh, I, I don't think that it's, <coughs> I don't think that you can really sustain money management in this environment that's taking 3%, two, two and a half, three percent fees a year. I don't think it works. Because I don't, I don't think there's that. First of all, if you have a narrow range of valuation, that consequently, and, and I, you know, I could go, I'm not a short seller, but I can go through the S&P 500 and just, you know, kind of look at the whole thing. And I think, Wait a minute, I don't really see anything that that outlandish. 
And so, yeah, I, maybe I'm wrong. But, but I just think that the whole short selling thing is going to be real tough. Yeah, I, I think there's going to be major pressure on hedge funds. You know, it's, it's going to be harder and harder to justify the fees. Um, given the efficiencies in the market and given how many people are trying to, to grab every inefficiency they can out of the market. Um, so I, I think that, you know, we go through another period of weak returns. I mean, hedge fund returns have not been that great over the last few years broadly, and their fees are incredibly high. And quite frankly, you would do better in, having invested just in the market if you look at it over a long period of time. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult for many hedge funds, um, especially the multi-strategy, to justify their fees. Yeah. I think we're all in agreement. And I, I think, you know, in addition to poor performance, I think the other thing which is becoming more evident is you have a lot of hedge funds that are not necessarily adding value for, through alpha. They have some exposure that they're constantly exposed to that may do well for a period of time. So if you go back to 2005, 2006, you could do a very simple thing. You could take a value fund and a small cap fund, and you could have done a decent job of replicating the returns for a lot of long short equity managers. And there are some strategies that are harder to replicate. You know, there's an illiquidity premium. But if really what you're doing is momentum or value or a style bet, that's much easier and much cheaper to replicate than it was 10 years ago. And I think that the hedge fund managers really are going to be under much more pressure to justify that they're doing something different for their 2 and 20. Just on the contrary view is that as long as the fees are still 2 and 20, don't hedge funds provide a, the fees provide a compensation structure that can attract the best talent out of the long only world? I mean, it would just be useful to hear what you're seeing on that side. I don't, I don't buy that. We don't lose anybody from dodging Cox about it, to go to hedge funds. We pay them a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't think that's, um, I know that's a thesis, but yes, I don't. So you're it. saying aligned, that, that no, you're, so you're, don't you buy all the best people. Provide an incentive for the best talent to go to that. <laughs> We actually, believe it or not, have had a lot of people coming to us from hedge funds <laughs> because there's more stability in our business. And, um, you know, I think that a lot of people are looking for stability. I think young people are looking for different things today than maybe they were when we started in the industry. So, um, you know, we, we've actually found that a lot of people are tired of you know, the rat race that, that is hedge funds, and, and we found a lot are interested in doing things like we're doing. Is there a last question? Great, we wore you out just as the <laughs> clock is expiring. Uh, please uh, join me in thanking John, Bill, and Russ.